I don't think 102 has a PC3 rec. Does it? I don't think so. Oh, sick. I think, a, I think it's just Math 3 3 b co rec. Oh, no way. Interesting. Yeah, but, was that a thing? I don't really? know. I, I, I remember it from the flow chart, but you know, it's been like three years since I had to worry about that. So. Um, yeah, I think it's fine. Yeah, it's, uh, right. Try out 102 <laughs> instead of like uh, 2 or BL. Um, just like don't overwhelm yourself because you're going to be taking math and stuff like that. Okay, hello. We're going to get started now. I hope you all had a chance to do the sign in form because you've had many minutes. Oh, wait a minute. Come on, <laughs> man. <laughs> We really sat here for 20 minutes. <laughs> All right. OK. Well, uh, so yeah, this lecture, we're going to do the last thing you need for the fall rack competition and like fully assembling your pits. We're going to talk about the IR sensors. But before we get into that, uh, hi. I am one of your project <coughs> and lab managers. My name is Andrew, uh, Andrew Fantino. And, uh, Recently, we had a bit of a problem with uh, environmental health and safety because of how the soldering stations were left. And so, since you guys are the project that uses the soldering stations the most, at least currently, then that means that it was you guys not picking up after yourselves. And so, I'm here to tell you guys that like the reason why we can't solder currently is because it was dirty and now we can't solder. So that is why we had to take all the soldering irons off from the soldering stations and leave it naked. Um, I'm hoping that this would be a learning opportunity for you guys and for me um, to set my expectations correctly for all of you. So if you come in the lab, uh, respect the space, please. Um, I was telling the other officers, I do not want to be project and lab janitor. Um, it's not my responsibility to be the janitor. It's your responsibility to clean up after yourselves and be adults. Um, you guys are all over 18, probably. You're adults. You're 17? Yeah. I was too at this time. Um, it's fine. But you're an adult. You know, you're living on your own, or at least on the dorms. You don't have mom and dad to take care of you and pick up after you. So please, like, do me a favor and do all of us a favor so we don't have to pick up after you. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, and then partially it was me and Megan's fault because we were not really cracking down on you guys for cleaning up. But yeah, that being said, we will do better in the future. Does anyone have any questions before I go on what their expectations are for a clean soldering station? Yeah. Uh, does it just mean like don't leave bits of like solder everywhere, or does it go beyond that? It does cover that. Like um, like I've mentioned in my announcement in the Micronauts announcements like a few days ago, like that includes like putting all the equipment back in the right place where you found them in the, well, not necessarily where you found them, but just back to where they belong, like soldering irons back on their stands, all the other like um, wire strippers and all that back to like their cells, pick up all your trash. This includes like tape, this includes stripped wires, solder balls if you manage to make any and all that. So yeah, the little solder balls went around there. Clean that up. Um, make sure your ventilator is on when you're soldering. Um, I've noticed that some people have not been turning on those fans. And they're important because lead poisoning is not fun. And uh, you don't really know it's not fun until it's too late. So don't do that. Um, also, hand tools, solder, flux. Uh, if you drop flux on the table, we have paper towels, just wipe it up. Um, yeah. Cool. Anything else? Awesome. Have a good day, guys. Enjoy. See you, Andrew. All right. Now, lecture time. Uh, oh. OK, yeah. So as I was saying earlier, um, we're be going to be covering like how we use our IR sensors on our racks. Um, so first part, IR sensors, why we use them, and then we're gonna go over like the schematic because like this one, it does. We do talk about like the actual implementation of the circuits a little bit more because it's a little bit more complicated than just like turning on an LED with a resistor with it. Um, and then after that, we're just gonna go over like what we do in the software to actually like read these analog values. And yeah, we'll start off by explaining what exactly is an IR sensor and like why they work, how they work and all that. 
So, yeah. The main thing is like, you have an emitter, which is basically like an infrared LED that emits light. And you guys, maybe you guys have taken one physics 1C, maybe not yet, but light bounces off of objects. That's how we see, right? Well, similarly enough, infrared <coughs> light also bounces off of objects and its intensity is disproportional to this, to the inverse square law and all that. Closer objects reflect more light back. Darker objects reflect less light as it absorbs more of the light. And our receivers take advantage of that fact to estimate how far things are from its current position. And yeah, this, and we take advantage of our photo receivers. They actually change in terms of what voltages are read in our sensors. Well, not, they change the voltages that are detected and therefore we can estimate our distances from there. And why are we using our sensors? Well, the main thing is these are pretty easy to implement and require relatively few components and they're contactless and they are much smaller as compared to some of the other sensors you might see out there. Like you guys have probably, some of you guys have probably seen like the sonic sensors that are like used in like 4AL, 4BL for example. Those are pretty bulky, they're big and they require a lot of some extra like setup, whereas these, they can be compacted pretty well onto our smaller mice. And it can easily give us an analog value and we can use that to roughly measure distance and how far we are from walls. Yeah, so like that analog value would just be like how much light we're reading here. It's like if we get closer to the wall, then more light's gonna reflect. So we can tell in our code like, oh, the amount of light that we're detecting got higher, so we must be getting closer to the wall. Um, and then yeah, no light will reflect here because uh, there's no wall. Like, obviously a little bit of light would, be, would reflect back, but not as much as if there was a wall here. So yeah, is that, this making sense so far? Okay. Yeah, what's up? Um, we don't have to worry about like differently colored walls, right? It's all gonna be the same white wall. It's all gonna be the same wall. Yeah, like even, even the maze we do here, but like, or, like even mazes at other competitions, they all use the same exact like uniform wall. So that like if a mouse works here at the maze, it should work at every other competition you go to. Uh, and here's like oh, some of the cons of like why our sensors they still have a little they still have a bit of just like stuff we have to account for that may affect its performance, such as like ambient light. You guys remember the mouse we had at the very start of the year that we were trying to demo and it crashed into walls. Yeah, that got affected by a lot of just the random light that are around. Like sunlight affects it a lot. So does fire. Mm -hmm. Just because it emits a lot of IR light. And well, and the other thing is you need to actually put time into calibrating to measure actual distances. Like, yes, in theory, if you have this setup, you will be able to go to any competition and it will be able to read where the walls are. But day of competition, you you might have to do some fine tuning to just to be sure that you have like the correct way to sense that a wall is there. And because we're using the inverse square law to detect where walls are, because that's just kind of how light intensity works, we will be dealing with nonlinear scaling of distances, which will become a little bit annoying if you're just trying to like figure out values. And <coughs> unfortunately, as with all physical things, there are variations between identical sensors. Like we try to, manufacturing wise, they try, sometimes it just doesn't work out. Yeah, similar to how like when you run motors at the exact same speed with the exact same voltage, one will still s still go slightly faster than the other as you all have hopefully seen in assignment three because I know all of you have started working on that. Um, and then in terms of like the, oh, that one thing, but in terms of like the calibration and stuff, another thing that's affected by it is um, the voltage of your batteries because as you'll see in the next slides, we do power the, the IR emitters directly from the battery, similar to how we did with the motors. So uh, if the batteries are like slightly lower charge, then it would be like not as much light being out. Um, and then also in terms of ambient light, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Like you should obviously calibrate, but like in terms of like ambient light from light bulbs, that doesn't give off that much IR light. It's mainly just sunlight that gives off a lot of IR light. And then uh, last point. This, this last point, it doesn't really pertain to us, but just in general with IR sensors, the big caveat is if you're reflecting off different materials, there's going to be different readings. Each material reflects and like or absorbs light differently, so 
So yeah, that's so not something we have to worry about here. Yeah, so Justin, that does is more on your question. Like, what if a like, different colored wall is similar material? That would affect it. All right. Yeah. Are all the cushions held indoors? Yes. yes. <laughs> Just regulation's sake, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we are going to go deep into the circuits and for this one. I'm just gonna kind of just go nerd, just nerd emoji on you guys. Yeah, resident EE major. I'm CE. I don't know circuits, so like if y'all have any questions, she, she's got it. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, this may look like a mess. Don't worry, I'll walk you through all of it. And so basically, the main thing with this circuit, it emits the IR that we need. Right. So we have an IR LED that emits IR light. We'll need a transistor to switch it on and off. I know transistors have a lot of different uses, but for here we're using it as a switch. I'll go on that a little bit more. And you guys remember how with motors, we couldn't directly power it through a microcontroller because the microcontroller cannot supply enough current? Well, the same <coughs> issue happens here. And that's why we have a transistor as a switch. Yeah, you remember that guy from lecture two? Back again. And yeah, in general, with the switch is if this pin is high, this turns, this is like as if the switch is on and then the LED is high because it's a full circuit to like, it's properly like from vo voltage to ground, completes the circuit and all. Yeah, so just like another reminder, like from, from lecture two, uh, there's like the collector pin, the base pin, and the sort pin, something like that for the transistor. Basically, when you pass high voltage to the middle pin, then this lets current go through. So then that IR emitter will be able to have current going across it. Do you have a question? Uh, what is the purpose of resistor three? Uh, we will we'll get into that. We'll go into that. Don't worry yeah. about it right. for now. So. And yeah, the first part is the IR emitter. We have like the part, we have the part number there and like it's actually linked. So if you guys want to go back and look at it, and like look through a status sheet on its page, you guys could do it later. So yeah, the forward voltage of it is 1.3 volts, and because this is a diode, voltage only goes in one direction, and this is just like the, just the optimal voltage it operates at. And like the forward current, because again, as diodes only basically allow voltage and current in one direction, and basically does not allow it through the other direction due to the way how diodes are, so we have a max current in the same direction of 100 milliamps. And this specific one um, emits 880 nanometers, which is in the infrared range. And then it has a 15 degree degree angle, which is like 15 degrees from like the, 15 degrees right out from like the vertical. Yeah. And nanometers being the wavelength of the light that it emits. So yeah. like in the, frequ or in the wavelength spectrum, this would be IR light. Okay. Uh, and then and then we have the MOSFET, and MOSFETs, in, in our case, we'll be using it as a switch. In like other like deeper analog circuits, they'll go into their other uses, but that's outside the scope of this project. And this basically controls the current that flows <coughs> through the emitter. Basically, either it just halts the current at all and you just don't complete your circuit, or it allows just the rest of it to go through. And it just basically, yeah, it's, for now, we'll just use it as a switch. Is it not just like a normal transistor? Or? It is a normal transistor, but in our purposes, we'll use it as a switch. We, I know like transistors could be used in like amplifiers and all that more, but for now, our purpose, it will just, it's just because you have your source gate and drain, and we're just taking advantage of just the gate, just kind of turning it on and off, connecting the circuit and unconnecting the circuit, and just using that as a way to easily toggle whether or not we have our IR emitter on or not. And yes, we have these two capacitors. They are our bypass capacitors. And it stabilizes the supply voltage from the switching noise because as it turns on and off, it actually takes a while like physically to stabilize if it's fully on or if it's fully off. And these capacitors sort of just, these capacitors, they like supply voltage or takes away voltage as needed to keep like the voltage levels constant through the circuit. And yeah, this, because we don't have to wait until this guy is done stabilizing, if we have these, it reduces the amount of time we have to wait before we could just kind of just move things around. Like, you turn it on and off and on. Uh, and, yeah, so we are going to
gonna like start going into what each of the resistors are doing. This one specifically is to limit the current flow from the microcontroller to the MOSFET because the MOSFET actually has potential to actually outsource a lot of current back into the microcontroller, which we don't want because it could fry it. So we just slap the resistor in there so it doesn't like put out too much current into back into the microcontroller. And our pull down resistor, it's so if we close our gate, this is sort of in a weird state because we don't know what's going on over here. And this comes into a state of like floats. It's sort of not like not like your decimal point number float, but as in it, it is neither one or zero in terms of ground or not grounded. So we just kind of put this resistor here so it so you could draw any excess current and just properly ground it so it's off and we don't accidentally turn it on because we because of just way physical circuits work. Uh, and yeah, so that, that floating state would happen when like if we say we don't set this pin to anything, like we don't pass it a zero or a one, it's just like sitting there, like not powered at all. So like it could have like a little bit of like excess current on it. We there's no guarantee. So to make sure that none of that like excess current like in its floating state activates the uh, the MOSFET the and then turns on the LED, then we have this resistor here to just eat up all of that excess current. Okay, uh, so everything. Oh, okay, so. so so it basically bleeds off everything that isn't like one. Yeah. yeah, this is like it eats up like very small amounts of current, but then once we have. Once we pass in a high voltage here, then um, this will voltage will always take the path of least resistance, which would be here. All right. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, and then we choose a high, actually. Here we go. And yeah, we chose a high resistance to keep the current draw low because current draw a lot of times it also introduces heat, which is not ideal. And considering we don't know if it's floating, we don't know how much current is in it. It's just nice to have like a bigger resistor so we don't like fry anything or we don't break anything as well. Yeah, I'll also add like um, the current draw would also go go down a lot like when we pass it, when we have a high value here because uh, if this was like a lower lower resistance then um, the current would be split between these two paths and then a lot of it would be burned up here. But we want most of our voltage to just go straight here so we don't have met much voltage draw. Yeah, and that's the last resistor we have. So remember when I said like diodes they allow cur they allow current to go through one way and they allow voltage to cross like go across it in one way. The thing is, diodes they don't exactly have resistors. So if you directly connect the diode from like a voltage source to ground, you fry things. This is why we put this is why I put a resistor up there because and the other thing is. Um, specifically, the emitter itself has like a maximum current that it operates at, so this helps us control what current goes through it when we when we finish the circuit. And we are going to go through some value calculations since our VCC, our PV3, it's at 3.3 volts, and the amount of voltage that the amount of voltage that could go through the emitter itself is at 1.3 volts. So you do a little bit of math, a little bit of Ohm's law. We settle with like we want 40 milliamps as our desired current. We calculate the, the amount of voltage that has to be dropped across this resistor. And because since diodes don't have resistance, it doesn't really affect the current. So you just calculate the current as in V equals IR, you isolate R and all that. Ohm's law, easy math. And we settle with 50 ohms as our desired resistor for this. And yeah, and I would just add that uh, a lot of these two constants, I believe, uh, came directly from the IR emitter data sheet. So we, that's where we get like the voltage drop, and then also the the desired current. Um, I know I mentioned that the maximum current it could pass is at 100 milliamps, but it's usually better to just set it at a lower current than like its maximum because it's just better practice in case there's like a spike or anything. Yeah. All right. uh, any, I believe that was our last slide on the emitter. Is everything making sense so far? Like why we have all the parts? Yeah, and if uh, you don't need to know exactly like how everything works, like how all these calculations work, I definitely don't. But um, yeah, just like from a, from a high level, just like know why these things are here. Just like, yeah. 
And now for the analog IR receiver circuit. It's a lot easier. Uh, so yeah, so this is what we have, what we call a phototransistor, and it is, uh, its purpose is to measure the amount of IR, IR light that it's receiving. Um, and then, so we have that phototransistor. We'll get into what each of these things do in a bit, but then we have a resistor here, and then with these two things, if you're taking like a basic surface class, you would recognize this, and it looks very much like a voltage divider. Um, and then, so basically, the amount, of, the amount of IR light here would affect how much current goes through it, and then that would affect how much voltage we see here, which we can actually measure using the microcontroller. Uh, so that's from a, a high level how it would work, and then, uh, so yeah, how the phototransistor works is the more IR light it receives, the more current that is passed through it. So like, just, um, it acts like a variable transistor based off of the level of lights it leads in. Yes. So basically, like, um, oh, it's a phototransistor, never mind. Yeah. Sorry, what, what, what were you about to ask, though? I was, curious. I was thinking, like, um, if that were a photoresistor, because... Oh. Like, um, like, photoresistors and phototransistors operate similarly, like, in terms of, like, they have, like, their equivalent resistances change based off of the level of light. Um, in our case, I believe it, it becomes, the, in our, the current one that we're using, it's more like, the more light it sees, the higher, the higher. Oh, for this one? Yeah, uh, like the higher resistance. No, the more light it sees, the lower, less. because it passes more current through, the more higher light you have. Right. Yeah. Um, all right, and then here's the specific one that we need. Uh, we added the links for them, because in assignment 4B, you will actually be creating these circuits, uh, and then you'll use them in winter for when you design your mount, your competition mice. Uh, but yeah, these, it, it has like a, a uh, like a curve of like values that it's good at differentiating between, and then that would be these values. Um, notice that uh, our emitters were emitted 880 nanometers, and which is falls right, right in the middle of the sweet spot for this. Uh, so that's like, that's ideal. That's why we pick like these pair of emitters and receivers, and then uh, this is just like 50 milliamps of like max current going through this, uh, and then 70 70 volts of max. Um, it doesn't look 70 volts that it could go through, but since we're operating at 3.3 volts, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, like, it's, it's chilly. Yeah, just just some information we grab from the data tree, uh, and then next we have the resistor down here, which makes this system act as a voltage divider. So the more, basically, the more current that we pass through Q1, um, remember that like for, for all circuits, um, it's, it's gonna be a, a loop, so like we need to get rid of all of, our, all of our voltage across the whole thing. So if we're letting more current through here, then we know that this resistor is going to eat up more of that current. So that's basically the idea, and so that would cause a higher voltage drop at that resistor. And then if there's a higher voltage drop at that resistor, that would mean that right here is um, a higher voltage, which we will measure with the mic controller. So um, more concise version of what I just said, IR phototransistor sees IR light, it lets more current pass through it, and then that would result in this resistor having to eat up more of that current. And then if, if all, more of the voltage drop happens here, that means that there's, well, more voltage here because from here to here, that's the voltage drop that the that the resistor eats up. Um, and then uh, we use the mic controller to measure that. Uh, and then in terms of actually calculating the value of this resistor, uh, we chose to we chose 1.8k. There's actually a good amount of values that you can choose, but like it has to be above 65 ohms. Um, just for it to actually work as a voltage divider, but we could use like a 10k ohm resistor, but then that would eat up, that would draw more current from the battery, just from ohm's law. And then Megan, do you have anything to add, add about that? Yeah, it's like, there's like some fine tuning you could do in terms of like sensitivity of like what's red. I believe this value is specifically picked because it just works well like general competition settings would be indoors, no sunlight and all that. So like it creates, and it's like, it, it does eat enough of the current, 
but it also retains enough it's still a sensitive enough to like detect like minute differences between like if you're like a few centimeters versus like a few like half a centimeter off from the wall and all that yeah yeah uh, and then, so yeah, from a software perspective, we're just going to look at like how we actually set up reading these values because um, remember all of our inputs so far for um, MicroMouse and most, oh yeah, and MicroMouse have been digital, digital inputs, zero or one, but this, <coughs> this is going to be like a voltage from zero to 3.3 .3 volts. So we're just going to look at how we will actually deal with that. Um, so then first of all, well, answer, assignment's going to talk a lot, of, a lot about it, but uh, the basic gist of it is um, the steps we're going to do are we're going to turn the IR emitter on, and then we're just going to get like a few values, a few readings from the IR, IR receivers to like just average it out, just like take out any, any errors, and then turn it off, and then move to the next emitter. Um, so then basically what we're saying here is we only turn on one emitter at a time, because uh, we don't want the receivers to get to be measuring light from the other emitters. Uh, and then, so here, uh, the this will be like reading the voltage, and then we're gonna check for a certain threshold. Basically, you're gonna experiment to determine that, like, oh, what what value does this IR receiver need to see before we consider that, like, oh, there's a wall in front of us, and then. Um, ambient values will affect this threshold, but as long as you don't do this outside, you'll be fine. Uh, and yeah. So then, uh, oh, I didn't actually talk about how it measures the voltage, but uh, basically how microcontrollers measure analog values, like zero to like the max voltage, is they use what's called a analog to digital converter. And then that's just like, specific pins on your microcontroller <coughs> has analog to digital converters built in, and then you will just like, it's like a pretty, it, similar to like the encoder encoder setup, it's just like, it's built into like the microcontroller and then we will just like utilize that feature. And then it will give us a, it will take that analog voltage and then give us like a value from like say zero to 1024 that like represents the uh, values of the, to represent that voltage. All right, and then software in terms of actually setting up, up reading the emitters and receivers, um, you will want a delay between turning on the emitters and, and reading the IR receivers because light does take like a tiny bit of time to bounce back. And then uh, we actually need to worry about that here because our microcontrollers go very fast. So we recommend about like 60, uh, 60 microseconds for the value to stabilize. Again, we'll talk, the assignments talk a lot more about this. But then also what I said, turning on one emitter at a time. Uh, and then, oh, one thing that I didn't actually pay attention to last year when I did MicroMouse. Um, you can't read the IRs in your PID control functions. Uh, these PID control functions being like the PID controller that you set up and it's run by Cystic. Um, if you haven't done assignment three, don't worry about what I'm saying, but it'll, it'll make sense eventually. But basically, uh, our PID control functions are run like very fast, like every millisecond, I believe. Uh, and then like, it's run by a special function called Cystic. And then if we read the IR function, the IR LEDs within that function, it will make the time that it takes for that, for that code to actually run go longer than what Cystic, how fast Cystic runs. So like, say like Cystic runs a line of code every millisecond, and these take longer than a millisecond, then it will just pile up, and then it will crash, and you won't know why it stopped working. Uh, so basically, yeah, don't worry about it too much right now. It's just like, if you're doing stuff in the future, keep that in mind. Uh, and yeah, so I just wanted to show you guys real quick. Wait. Oh, yeah. So. Wait, so wouldn't, wouldn't the speed of light be like an odd factor? It would be more like the... Um, it's, more I like think the it's just the other thing is more like not, yeah. not just only because of like the um, how much time it takes for the light to bounce back. Like the other factor is more like um, these phototransistors. It's more like when it starts reading in light, it takes a while. It just kind of like bounces between values before settling down for a value. Okay. You just gotta wait for it to just kind of more stabilize. This, that's the other reason why we're taking the average of like several, several readings before process. 
probably using it later on in the code as we will, as you guys will do in like assignment 4A. It's just one part light propagation, the other part, just the part takes a little bit of while to just like, I'm reading IR light and I'm constantly reading IR light. Let me admit, th let me just kind of stay at this value for, the, for now. Oh, and also the time that it takes for the emitter to actually start emitting light. <coughs> yeah. Um, so I have what you what you guys will be doing in assignment four. Uh, you will be uh, well. This is what you did in assignment two, but you will be implementing these these four functions uh, like read left ir, read right ir, front left, front right, and then you can look, and then like these will give you. Um, values, I believe from 0 to 4096 is what we have our code doing. And then if we look at live expressions, uh, you can actually see. You can see. Uh, so yeah, you can see, uh, these. You can see like up there. Don't worry about like the other IR stuff we have in there. That's yeah. It's just our own stuff. These ones, okay. But, like, you see the ones it. covered up there. But yeah, so you can see. Ah, uh, camera can't see. Um, do you want to point the camera here or? I can, yeah. <laughs> okay, guys. Nothing's oh. got. Okay. Just easy clock. Oh wait, <laughs> it disconnected. Mm. Don't this... don't worry about it, guys. Okay. You know, we're gonna we're gonna try it again. It's okay. Okay. Target is not responding. Hmm? Did you plug it in weird? Okay, no, it it uploaded. The beginning. We're just gonna unplug and replug. <laughs> that solves everything. Did you name your competition now crewmate? Yes. <laughs> you, I, you've probably like, seen it, yeah, right? You saw the, the you, PCB, yeah. You've seen it, yeah, yeah. So. That looks like. Oh. Like, yeah. The child. That's that what was... we named our competition mouse last year. We, our rat was named the child, and therefore we had to name our competition mouse child v two. Hmm. You guys are. Wait, did you guys work on the same? Oh yeah, yeah we, we were, were on, on the same, same team, team last year. year. We had a third teammate, but then he disappeared after <laughs> a few weeks. We had two third teammates, and then and we got a new <laughs> third teammate, and he disappeared. <laughs> Oh, under mysterious circumstances. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Do I? Uh, do I? Do I? Take the camera back. I don't know. Okay, I'll put the camera back. Uh, okay. We'll try it another day, but, um... Okay, you know what? We're... I'll try this again in a few minutes. We're just gonna go back, but, like, pretend that demo worked, and then in the live expressions, it would have been, like, if I... If I move the, the wall closer to the IRs, then the value would have gone up. And if I move the wall <coughs> farther, then the values would have gone down. I think it saw your shirt briefly while you were holding it. Yeah, yeah. It, it showed it for a few seconds, but... And then it died. And then it died. But anyways... Moving on. Any questions? <laughs> Hi. Yes. Okay, so with the IR sensors and emitters, um, how durable are they? Like, say, if our microbus were to crash into a wall. Oh, no, don't worry. Like, a lot of people have theirs crash into the wall. Like, yes, there are times they snap off, but they are relatively fine to re-solder back on. <laughs> we don't recommend you crashing into walls, but we know it's bound to happen. <laughs> we don't have a lot of backup parts, though. Please don't break them. Actually, we have a lot of backups for those. Wait, yeah, we but anyways, do, we yeah. Do so this like, year, sorry. you you will, it will survive a good amount of crashes, but at some point, it will snap off. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Any other question? <laughs> yeah, so, Leon. Like, if we have a strategy that requires crashing a decent amount. <laughs> Dude, this which, is just like everyone else at AMC um, last year. Yeah. Okay. So, so little little secret strategy for you guys. Um, for our competition mouse last year. Uh, we had, like, if if this was our mouse, we had two toothpicks hot glued, one here and one here, so that when we crash into the wall, we don't damage the LEDs and it will straighten us out. Oh. Like, we had additional code to straighten it out, but that one was also that, in case. That was the backup. That was the backup, <laughs> yes. If you could 
can add toothpicks, can we just like add rods to the side of our mouth so that it never like veers off the center? Well, that will make turning awkward, and I'm fairly sure that's against my and mouse okay. rules. How does that even work? I feel like it gets stuck. It will get, it'll get stuck and dirty. I feel. Eh. I mean, well, I mean, try like it. The, it's like the um, the like moving a ladder through a hallway problem. You know, like. Like you have to calculate like what you have to start. Yeah. Okay, we'll have a point turn, guys. Come on. <coughs> All right. Any yeah. other questions? All right. Yeah. Uh, Leon, what's up? <laughs> All right, on slide one, I noticed I lost the game somehow. Eh? <laughs> oh. Right. What game? Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll we'll go back to that. <laughs> I I also don't know why that's there, but all right. Anyway. I think it was just. One of us during the summer felt like doing a little bit of trolling. <laughs> if you you don't know about the game, I don't. Okay, you know we'll, we don't we'll talk want about to this later. Yeah, yeah. yeah, what's up? Uh, on one of the, the transition sites, it says ICU. What's that stand for? <laughs> Are you looking at me? You made these slides. <laughs> <laughs> right, I made these. Um, I was just trying to put down corny stuff on the slides. Okay. Okay. Anyways, let's move on. Wait. Oh. Do it, do it, do it. What's up? Okay. Uh, so like, just just to review, like each infrared LED is like activated like for a short burst, and then. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. We turn on the LED, turn it off, and then. Well, actually, I don't know if we turn it off yet, but then we read the receiver, and then we turn the the. Everything else off. And yeah. it's and it's sequential, right? So one LED. Yeah. Just, yeah. One LED. Okay. There is you can. Some people do it so that like, you turn on both front LEDs at the same time, because uh, like there's, you're never gonna have a situation where you only want to look at one of them. But in our assignments, we just have it sequentially. Right? Yep. If we're not gonna use SysTick to like check the LED, okay. um, how are we gonna get it? Like we need a separate. Throw one. it in the wild. <laughs> yeah. So um, basically, what you'll see in the assignment is uh, you will implement like the really basic maze solving algorithm where like if there's no wall in front of me go one cell forward and then if there's a wall in front of me now turn in either direction like turn right if there's no wall to the right of me otherwise turn left it's like only after completing each of these motions do we actually check the walls and then there are there you can set it up uh like we eventually recommend this um but you can set it up where like it looks at the sides, side walls, like the left and right wall, assuming that there are walls, and then it will it can tell like how far I am from these walls. So then it will like move and like shift your turn angle. We don't have that in assignments, and that is we'll Additional. give you guys hints, but it's just that's bonus stuff for for later. Or if you're really daring, you can start trying after you get four A done. Yeah, that's like an optimization that you would make for the competition, but. For, the, for our purposes, we just want you guys to, 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 to detect make walls. It to make it through the maze without actually being like, oh, I thought there wasn't a wall there. Yeah, okay. And then next, yeah. these are just the assignments for this week. Uh, can't do this one right now, but um, we, so basically how assignment four would go is you'd, uh, you'd solder everything on, like in terms of the IR sort of just basically fill in all the leftover gaps in your PCB so that it's a fully fully soldered PCB and then you would you would set up like in code what we were talking about, just like reading the analog values using the using the analog to digital converter and then just navigate through, implement the very basic maze solving algorithm. But since we can't solder right now, um, we would recommend that you guys like still work on this assignment and then just like set up the code and because you can't actually test the code until you have the code basically fully done. It's just one of those things. So like, you'll be able to like still write the code, and then hopefully by next week or when we get back from Thanksgiving, you'll be able to actually test it and like fully solder. Soldering should take, I want to say like two hours. Yeah, it's like it's a quicker. lot of parts. You guys remember how the top half of your board is kind of empty? Well, you guys are gonna change that soon. It's, it's a lot more SMB parts. I expect me like two hours. Maybe like one yeah. hour if you're quick. Uh, um, and just one thing, if any of you guys are worried about the, because of recent events, we cannot solder in the lab at the moment. 
Um, we will be trying to look into maybe getting like work sessions in the maker space or something. We'll let you guys know, but just we'll update you if we can come to do Saturday in the lab. We'll update you if we're gonna try to like make work sessions happen in other places that allow Saturday and all that. We will keep you guys updated. Yeah, and then obviously if, if you just want to walk into the maker space and like solder yourself, that is fine too. Yeah, we just can't solder in the lab, but then after that, assignment 4B is a short one. You're just recreating the schematics that we, the circuits we talked about during lecture in Eagle, and then we just have you guys do that just because you guys are going to be using those circuits when you design your mice in winter quarter. So I'll go with some adjustments, but just general gist, you have most of it. Just <coughs> A few yeah. later. So assuming we'll be able to finish assignment four, uh, week ten is when we're planning to have our fall rack competition. This one is just like all the all the teams that s survived, I guess. <laughs> survived. Uh, <laughs> well, just basically just like compete and like see whose rat can solve a I want to say it's like eight by eight maze. So it's is that just like eight. completion or like? Yeah. Huh? Well. The thing is, you want to try to get there the fastest, because we will try to have prizes. Emphasize no, no. on try. We will not try. We will have prizes. <laughs> the quality of those prizes, <laughs> debatable, <laughs> but we will. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then if like soldering situation, we can't solder for like the next month. But I kind of doubt that. Um, we will push this back to probably the beginning of winter quarter. But just keep in mind, like after assignment four, you will have everything you need to. Hypothetically, solve a maze. Uh, yeah. And um, quick plug for Idea Hacks. This is a really cool hardware hackathon that um, a lot of like our officer board has been helping to put together, put to run together. You're on food committee. You know part of it. And kind of. Yeah. So basically, what Idea Hacks, the whole gist of it is like it's a 36-hour hardware hackathon. We give you like all the all the components like um. Like microcontroller boards, like like Arduinos, also like the more advanced Arduinos, and like all the sensors, and a lot of cool cool other things. One of the things we have is like uh, like a digital coin sensor for like like arcade machines. Like it is like how how arcade machines like can track how many coins have been put in. We actually, have one of those parts. I don't know how many, but um, we basically give you everything you need to create a full like hardware project from start to finish. And then that's going to be. Uh, these dates, I will. That's they like put the same date for the. <laughs> Just it's around week three, I believe. It might be the same weekend as the Martin Luther King Jr. weekend this year, just because of how scheduling worked out. Yeah. We will be in Ackerman Grand Ballroom, which is just right in the middle of campus. Like it's on campus. You guys will get food. You guys will get T-shirts. Um, you guys will get project experience for you and resume padding because that's important for internships and any job apps. And think because this year's theme is gaming, we have a game room. Lots of prizes, lots of networking, and you get to meet a bunch of cool people there as well. And we welcome anyone with any level of experience to just kind of hop in, get creative, make your project. And yeah, so ideahacks.www.ideahacks.la is where this, where it's all set. It's where you can sign up for it, and I believe you have to go through like the sign in button and create an account through that to be registered for the hackathon this year. And yeah, register by November twentieth to make sure you have a shirt in your in your preferred size. Yeah. So um, I I did idea hex last year. It was a lot of fun. Um, last year the theme was like environment and like sustainability. So my group's project was like creating like a network of internet connected trash cans so like you could um it could like detect its fullness level and then like from from a connected web server you'd be able to track the locations and also be able to lock lock the trash cans from that web server um so the whole point was like last year covid there was like a lot of a lot of overflow trash cans so, like this one this system would like notify maintenance like when a trash can was filled and then also lock it so that no more trash could be put in um so yeah that was my project it's it was teams of five it was a lot of fun get 36 hours to just like either meet new people or hang out with your friends. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, sure. Oh yeah, these are some other projects from previous years. And then also that is about what you should expect from like Ackerman Grand Ballroom. And like, I believe this is the first time in like, it's the first time since COVID we've been able to properly hold this event in person. It'll be very hype. And just like, yeah, imagine this. And you get to be part of this. Yeah, a little wow. bit. I, I 
I can know if it's up. Oh, what's up? Wait, so there's no prompt. You can just like do anything related to the the. You're like, well, within hardware constraints. Well, actually, nah. Oh, yeah. Well. Okay. Oh, so like, you, like, you get graded. Part of your oh, so like at the end of the competition, there's like judges who will like judge each one, and then you like you pitch your product or whatever. Um, and then part of the grading is like how well you match the theme of the of this year. And then on on a on the idea hacks website, it will like tell you more about like what what kind of projects they're looking for. Um, basically. Anything this year is like anything game related. It could be like gamifying like a, a mundane activity in your life or like promoting like an environmentally good practice, like gamifying that. Uh, but yeah, and then so these are some projects from previous years. Uh, these these two, um, this one was made by officers, e not Eli, uh, Tim, Sedan, and Prem, and some other people that I don't know, but like they're like. This was using like outdoor sensors, like humidity and like uh, air pressure. I don't know. Uh, basically, just like the purpose of this is like you put it outside, and then it will detect if like a wildfire is happening. So then it would be like a fast response warning, and then it'll, it also had like a connected website. Um, and then this one, the top one, that was a treasure tracker compass. So basically, it's like kind of like save points for in game, where like you could walk around to like say I walked over to Afterman right now. And then I would save that location, and then I walk back here, and then I choose that location for my GPS, and then it would automatically point to where, wherever that saved location was, and then you could have like four different locations saved. I think that was first place last year. That was pretty cool. And then there's some other stuff that I don't know, but it's a lot of fun. I I think like if you love if you like making stuff, then I would highly recommend doing it because it's also free, and it's also during like week two, week three ish. Y'all probably won't have that much work during that time. So yeah. It's like, don't worry if you don't have like a full team yet. I believe there will be team mixers where you get to just meet up with different people and then just form teams then. But like, yeah, trust in me, trust in us. This will be a fun event and we highly recommend you guys to join. All right. Uh, oh yeah, so a little bit more. Um, GBs. I, if you guys applied to GBs, and got in. We got a lot of applications, so unfortunately we did have to cut some people. Uh, but our review and I, what's that? That's tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow, 7.30. If you're in my GB, I'm sorry, I won't be there. I'm busy. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's at, it starts at 7.30 tomorrow in some location. Uh, and then other stuff. So in case, oh, oh yeah. Uh, it's so. like, and then there's like a resume interview workshop oh, happening before we forgot to put it on that slide our bad and i believe it starts at 5 30 it's online it's on zoom details can be found in the actively discord and um yeah. yeah so that resume interview workshop that kaden and jessica are holding that would just be like um you'll come in it's on zoom and then they will talk about like what a good resume looks like and then after that there will be zoom breakout rooms where you either get like one-on-one -on -one resume help with like an officer or upperclassman or you can do like interview practice. Uh, so yeah, that would be a very good thing. I think it's a really good experience to get if you're like a freshman or sophomore, just like know what like the interview process kind of looks like. So yeah, and then next Monday, uh, well first of all, sorry, sorry we haven't been having work sessions lately. We're busy. Um, <laughs> but Monday, it will be a like very small, like 20 minute lecture hopefully, just like on like getting started designing your mouse PCBs in winter quarter. Just like to, to get you guys started and thinking about that, we don't expect you guys to actually start yet, but we're not holding a lecture in week 10 or finals week, so it's here. Uh, and then right after that, we are going to head, head back to the actual Lee Lab to give you guys free pizza, um, <coughs> and then also have a work session. It's uh, on one part, congrats, you survived midterm season. Yeah. We will ignore that final season is coming up, but you survived midterm season. And for many of you, it's your first midterm season. Congratulations. And like, yeah, we'll be doing a little bit of work session if you guys want to catch up on work, but yeah, you have free pizza. Or you could just get the free pizza and vibe leave. for a bit and leave. But that is going to probably be Monday, 6.15. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry for it not being on Tuesday. Monday Nobody's being, I'm not in town on Tuesday. Uh, yeah, and then a little bit more assignment 3A and 3B do 
That's also not the right date. It's supposed to say Friday. Okay, yeah, it's due Friday. Um, yeah, if you guys need help or like are struggling with that, please reach out to us. We are always available. We want we want you guys to be doing stuff. And also, if you guys are struggling on something, please ask like before you sink like hours into it, because um, like chances are it's just gonna be like we're just gonna look at it and like oh that's what you're doing wrong. It'll it'll save you time. Just never be afraid to ask for help. I'm in 2A and 2D. I hope you guys are done with that, but if not, that's okay. I forgive you. All right. Yeah. Oh, my favorite part. <laughs> I can look at the, the gamer versus sim. And then this, this is the last slide, by the way. Uh, so yeah. Thank um, you to everyone that signed in. I feel like there's more than 11 of you here, but. <laughs> We didn't. Okay. Oh well. Oh, okay. it just jumped up to twelve. That's Yo. crazy. Thanks, Justin. <laughs> All right. I, I, like, I, I forgot to answer the sim versus gamer question. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, anyone else who hasn't signed, please sign in now. Break the tie. Break but, the tie. Um, yeah. Maybe. So for this one, there was there was no correct answer, as far as I'm aware. So, Don't worry, we'll we'll ask them directly about this tonight. We were we were hoping that you guys would be able to decide for us who was the gamer or who was the sim because well, it's, it's they up are in the both. air. They are both, and we're trying to see if you guys can vibe check. Yeah, who is but I guess I guess there is no right answer. All right. You try. And then I'm gonna try to do the demo one more time. Otherwise, we're done for today. Now y'all are ready to make moving mouse in maze now. We also we cleaned up the maze like literally Monday for you guys to start throwing your rat in there and letting it run. Please put that to good use. Yeah. Thank you. Alright. Thanks for coming. Yeah, for that. Thank you. Thank you.